What is my purpose? Pass the butter. Thank you. In this video, we are going to look at all of the new civics coming with the next DLC for Stellaris, The Machine Age. We're also going to be looking at the two new mega structures, or as the devs are calling them, kilo structures that are coming, what exactly they will do, and finally finish off by looking at auto modding. A fantastic buff for any empires focusing on their species traits like biologically ascended empires. Don't worry biological enthusiasts, you are still getting something good out of patch 3.12. So with absolutely no further ado, let's dive into the first civic and find out what is going on. The first batch of civics we will scrutinize are the Guided Sapience civics. These civics focus on coexistence with natural or created pre-sapient species and the environment around them. Their homeworld and Genesis Ark colony ships uplift some of the most promising local wildlife to pre-sapient status creating a genesis preserve that increases both society research and unity. The bonuses for the genesis preserve are also doubled on Gaia Worlds. This civic is available to every single empire type by the look of things. You can be a megacorp, you can be a regular individualist biological, you can be a hive mind, and you can be a geshed out machine. These civics are basically the same for all four empire types. You will unlock the Genesis Ark ship. This will replace your regular colony ship. We can see that on the bottom right of the set of screenshots. Colonies will gain the Genesis Preserve with three pre-sapient pops. Looking at the jobs here, those pre-sapients are going to be generating a small amount of amenities. I don't think they use any amenities, so that's a net positive here, but I'm not 100% certain on that. You will gain unity from uplifting pre-sapient species and you cannot build alien zoos, of course, because the, I think, Genesis Preserve replaces that. You will get a big modifier to your terraforming speed and cost, minus 25% cost, plus 25% terraforming speed. If you are a regular biological empire, or probably an individualist machine, you can get an empire counselor slot, the Master of Guidance, or as a megacorp, the Director of Guidance, that grants plus 5% research speed for biology per skill level. Coupling this with a biological ascension might be the way to go. If you're some sort of geshed out consciousness, your nodes, your cognitive nodes, will get an additional 25% experience gain. We can also see that the Genesis Preserve reduces our planet size, the number of districts it can carry by two. That's not great. We're getting 5% society research from jobs and 5% unity from jobs at the cost of two districts. That's not the best bonuses. The unity especially is kind of take it or leave it. The society research is helpful given we have so few research bonuses now in the game. Overall, this looks like it could be quite a thematic origin. Not particularly powerful though. Also important to note that hostile civics like Devouring Swarm and origins like Necrophage are entirely excluded from taking this civic, which I think makes a lot of sense. Any good citizen of Super Earth will understand the natural design civic intimately. While other empires seek to improve themselves through genetic modification or through ascension, others are quite certain that they are already at the apex of evolution. This one seems to be available to regular biological empires, I believe, and hive-minded empires not machine empires as far as I can tell. This society is adamant that nature has already created perfection in its people's genetic code. That's at least what Super Earth is telling them anyway. They have long devoted their medical and governmental services to the health and preservation of natural, untouched genome sequences. Warning, all ascension paths are blocked. Warning, unable to modify organic species. You will get plus two trait points at the start of the game for a total of four points and plus two trait picks for a possible total of seven trait picks. So we can probably take four positive traits and three negative traits. You can also build the Genomic Services Center and you lower approval of empires that have started Ascension traditions. You also get plus 0.5 society research from researchers, so they'll be producing a base of 3.5 research. 
Increasing base research is so much better than a research modifier or research bonus because it will be multiplied by bonuses like stability, anything improving your research output. On top of that, biological empires have access to the Grand Genomicist, which for every skill level as an official or scientist, so actually quite a lot of roles can go into that, you'll get plus 2% citizen pop happiness. That means if you have, let's say, a level five leader with plus one or so, you know, you've got level three or four and you've got a few bonuses to put the effective skill level up to five, you're getting an additional 10% happiness empire-wide on top of the early game starting bonuses. I can see this being quite strong for certain rush origins. If you're trying to have some sort of rush build, getting additional traits in there on your starting species would be very, very useful. Later on in the game, you might feel like you want to get rid of it. Unfortunately, this civic cannot be manually added or removed after the start of the game, so it will be locked in forever. I must admit, I don't particularly love civics that are locked forever. I think they would be better suited to being an origin rather than a civic if they are locked in forever. Because of course, origins are locked in forever. So if a civic is locked in, it's basically like an additional origin, but taking up one of your civic slots. Not my favorite idea. The Genomic Services Center is very nice though. Actually, you're going to get plus 10% resources from jobs empire-wide and plus one medical workers. On top of that, you'll also get 2.5% pop growth speed for each ascension perk your empire has taken. So if you've taken three ascension perks, you're looking at an additional 7.5% pop growth speed. Medical workers will produce a unity for each of your ascension perks taken. And that's basically it. You're going to be having medical workers on lots and lots of planets. Hive Minds have the Genomic Safeguard Wardens. They again get more resources from jobs and plus one spawning drones, which is like a medical worker, but that produces organic pop assembly, so it's probably a bit better. And these can, of course, be combined with getting more gene clinics or getting more uh, spawning pools if you need more assembly drones, spawning drones. This is not quite as good as an Ascension, for obvious reasons, but it kind of seems like it's half or at least a third of the way there. You're getting 10% extra resources from jobs on every planet very early on in the game, I would believe. If we start with this building, this could have potential for being a very strong rush origin. And if you're enjoying this video, please naturally design that like button. In 2003, human philosopher, I like how they noted it was a human, and Professor Nick Bostrom created a thought experiment about the potential existential threat an artificial general intelligence could pose even if given seemingly harmless directives. And we've got a quote from good old Nick. Suppose we have an AI whose only goal is to make as many paperclips as possible. The AI will realize quickly that it would be much better if there were no humans because humans might decide to switch it off. Because if humans do so, there would be fewer paper clips. Also, human bodies contain a lot of atoms that could be made into paper clips. The future that AI would be trying to gear towards but would be one in which there were a lot of paper clips but not many humans. This will be available only to gashed out machine intelligences Obsessional Directive lets you enjoy faulty programming that drives you to produce ever-increasing numbers of useless consumer goods, no matter the cost. Let's dive into what this Civic does. So, what are the effects? Well, you will get the Commodities Consolidation Situation, granting rewards upon completion if production targets are met. Growth Node Experience Gain will be also increased by plus 25%, and you cannot be Warbots. We can see at the bottom left here what happens when you reach your production target. There's a really barren world. Uh, we have accomplished the directive. The drones met the production output with the prescribed parameters. We require the final input for stockpile utilization. If you meet or exceed your quota, which we can see on the top right here in the situation, you will have options regarding what to do with your stash of office supplies toasters, handheld electronics, or whatever other form you imagine your consumer goods take. Until you make friendly contact with other empires, you will only have the option to create a spire of commodities, but later on you could trade them away for various resources. Most of your consumer goods will be removed, but the reward will scale with the amount that you produced. 
Failing to meet your quota will result in a bit of a breakdown until your new lower quota is met. On the other hand, the experience of failure does unlock a new direct to consumer goods purge type to make it easier to achieve your goal. Determined exterminators start with this purge type unlocked. Looking at the situation here, I can see that the active effects of fulfill are plus 10% consumer goods, plus 10% artisan drone upkeep and 5% additional unity. If you go into overdrive, you get 25% more artisan drone upkeep, but you do get 10% unity and 25% more consumer goods from artisan drones. The delivery date here seems to be 10 years and you need to produce 10,000 consumer goods in those 10 years. That seems to be a very high amount to attempt to complete. I'm a little concerned with that. Creating a spire is granting you a host of additional unity. So it could be the reason you might take this, this, uh, this civic, is to go for something of a unity rush. Traditionally, machines are very bad at making unity, but perhaps if you are all into your paper clips, you're very unified and therefore you can have a simply great time. Whatever the case, I'm really not sure producing a completely useless resource to then throw it away for a bunch of unity is going to be an effective means of expanding your empire. Though I think this civic is super flavorful, it might be a little weak. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's going to probably be quite fun to play as and roleplay as your little paperclip empire. Finally, robots are getting their own version of Diplomatic Core. Diplomatic Protocols will grant them plus two envoys, plus 25% diplomatic weight, plus 50 trust cap, plus 50% envoy improved relations, and plus 25% regulatory node experience gain. Ironically, I think this comes a little bit too late. The diplo weight could be slightly useful, but that is equivalent to a level two governor being on the council. That sucks. That really, really sucks. Um, yeah, the Diplo protocols is just the same as Diplo Core, and Diplo Core is not good anymore. Envoys are all right, but they can only now do spying or improving or harming relations. It is your leaders, your officials, that do the heavy work in the galactic community, the heavy work in your federations, and actually get the job done. I think diplomatic protocols and the equivalent, um, you know, diplomatic core should give bonuses and effects to leaders who are in the galactic community or placed in your federations. That would make more sense than just giving us these two random envoys. Some machines were designed to study war in all its forms. Enter the tactical algorithms. Commanders will start with the tactical algorithms trait. Now that is going to grant immortal lifespan on your leaders, which is pretty darn nice, you will get minus 30% monthly ship alloy upkeep, very good, and plus 60% monthly ship energy upkeep. Generally very bad, though you need alloys more for building more ships, so kind of all right, I suppose. The effects of this trait also scale with leader skill level. I'm not sure if this is the maximum or the minimum. I'm assuming it might be the maximum, minus 30% at level 10, and the minimum is minus three and plus 6% at level one, but we will have to see. We can also trade commanders, immortal commanders, let's not forget because of tactical algorithms, to other empires. That's really cool and thematic. You can create mercenary enclaves, and you start the game with the military academy on your planet, and I also assume the technology to build another one should you lose it. Your military academy will also grant the tactical insights bonus. This gives you, for every commander stationed outside of your empire, this is therefore an incentive to do lots of trading and give those commanders away, plus 2% evasion, plus 1% tracking, plus 5% shield and armor penetration. That allows you to bypass uh, shields and armor as long as they don't have hardening. Now, against other empires, if you're playing a single player game with the AI, I imagine it would be quite easy to give your commanders away to other empires. If you give away 
20 commanders, which is quite a hefty amount of unity. You're looking at, what, two to 3,000 unity, assuming they're level one or so. That would then grant you 100% shield and armor penetration on every single ship in your fleet. That is a crazy strong bonus. That basically means every single weapon you have will act as a bypass weaponry. This would be insanely good against the crisis. Holy crap. This is, I think, possibly the best buff I have ever seen in the game. Because if you can max this out at 100% shield and armor penetration, you, you've won. I mean, there's no military force that could stand against you and you simply have to give away 20 commanders. That is it. Give away 20 commanders to some people and make sure they don't die. On top of that, for every mercenary enclave under your patronage, you will gain plus 10% shield hardening. So people can't do this to you because you'll have shield hardening blocking their bypass weaponry nonsense. If all of that was not enough, you're also going to get plus 20 base intel level on every other empire, making it easier to find targets for your vastly, vastly more powerful bypass weapon equipped military. I mean, honestly, I'm just thinking for here, for example, of neutron torpedoes and kinetic artillery with full shield and armor bypass. I mean, you'd just put kinetic artillery on every ship, wouldn't you? I mean, I, I yeah, kinetic artillery, tachyon lances, bypass everything, go straight to the hull and deal massive bonus amounts of extra damage to those hulls. It's, it's nigh unstoppable. This is insane. Anyway, let's get back to these bonuses. So also 25% Legion node experience gain and plus one mercenary enclave capacity. So you can build mercenaries straight away. This is not exclusive with war bots. I think that one allows you to have a mercenary enclave as well. Um, and there's probably another civic that I'm forgetting. If you can remember, write it down in the comments below. I think there are a couple of civics that let you have mercenary enclaves as a machine. But honestly, wow, being able to give out immortal commanders to anyone else in the galaxy, and of course this is a bonus, so why would they not say yes, to get maximized shield and armor penetration, and I'm not even looking, we're giving out 20 commanders, let's say, that means we're going to be also getting 40% additional evasion, so max evasion destroyers are back on the menu, baby, and we're going to be getting 20% tracking. So yeah, I am going to have max evasion destroyers with computers and extra uh, tracking. So I can then put kinetic artillery on my max evasion destroyers and have them be full bypass weapons. This is insane. I cannot believe they've done this. This is so wild. I can't wait to take on a 25 times crisis with this nonsense. Honestly, it's going to be great. Do you know what else is insane? For only 10 euros or your regional equivalent, you can get your hands on Victoria 3, the Callisto Protocol, and Humankind Definitive Edition right now. Simply follow the link in the description to the Humble Bundle store and become a member of Humble Choice. You will not only get access to over 303 US dollars worth of games to keep forever. This isn't something where you subscribe and then lose access to the games after the subscription. Oh no, no, no. You'll also save up to 20% on the Humble Store and get access to even deeper discounts and offers. On top of that, 5% of your purchase goes to charity. And if you follow my link down in the description, you'll be supporting this channel. At the Augmentation Bazaar, you can build a better you. And all it will cost is an arm and a leg. The Augmentation Bazaar Civic will block all Ascension paths except Cybernetic Ascension. They also seem to be locked only to megacorp empires. Commodified cybernetics have spawned labyrinthine markets. Oh my goodness me, it's Blade Runner. Crowded with cut rate augmentation dealers, shady mod clinics, and harshly lit advertisements. Indulge in a synergy of flesh and circuitry, no matter your level of income. Your species gains one random basic cybernetic trait. These are, as we can see on the bottom left, either power drills, harvesters, or superconductors. That's basically a 15% bonus to either food, mineral, or energy output. Not amazing, but not that terrible either. It's a nice, modest bonus to have. Available buildings, augmentation, bizarre. This has a planet limit of one. It spawns one merchant and one augmentor job. 
The merchant is simply a merchant providing unity, amenities, and trade value, quite a bit of trade value as well. And the augmenter provides engineering research and amenities, though at the cost of quite a number of alloys. The merchant is also increasing planetary trade value and pop growth speed depending on the number of cybernetic species traits installed. The more traits they have, the more cybernetic traits they have, the more trade value and pop growth speed merchants will give on your planets. This is actually quite good. This is very good for trade. In fact, Augmentation Bazaars as a megacorp is going to really push hard for trade value based empires. Not as hard possibly as the virtual ascension path that's coming now where you can have um, ring worlds instantly filled up with lots and lots of pops thanks to the fact that they simply produce pops based on the number of available jobs. But let's not get into that right now. You also get an off-world implant hub holding building. This grants plus 10% trade value and plus two augmented jobs on the planet. Those jobs provide engineering research and amenities I assume for the local, you're going to be mainly getting that extra engineering research and the increase in trade value will increase the value of the branch office. Not the best branch office building I have seen, but also not the worst. You also have a modifier empire wide plus four trade value from all of your augmenters. So augmenters are going to be granting additional trade. If all of that was not enough, you get the Implant Impresario, which grants as a counselor plus 1% resources from Cyborg Pops empire-wide per skill level. That means you can get a bonus of up to 10% additional resource output on top of the other bonuses you're already getting from your Cybernetic Ascension, which is very, very good indeed. We're going to move over now to the new mega structures that are coming in with the Machine Age, or as they're calling them at the moment, Kilo Structures. First off, we have Dyson Swarms. The path to a Dyson Sphere of your own can be long and arduous, filled with empty building platforms and non-functional intermediate stages. Or at least, it used to be. Fresh with the machine age, the devs are introducing the Dyson Swarm, a predecessor and proof of concept for your Dyson Sphere plans. By putting many small satellites into orbit around a star, you can collect some of its output and enhance your research capabilities. But paradox, you say. We don't get research from Dyson Spheres. Correct. But you do get it from Dyson Swarms if you place them correctly. Dyson Swarms function differently than Spheres. Instead of producing energy all on their own, they amplify whatever resources their star produces up to 30 times. Yes, that little delicate three energy star will now produce 90 energy. And if you were to put it on a three physics star, that would be a decent 90 physics research from a single star. If you're really lucky and have an event spawn and an even rarer resource is added to a star, go right ahead and collect it all. If you get a rare resource, you can get 30 of that rare resource. That would definitely be worth it. Looking here at the, the text, this is the final level of a Dyson Swarm. We can see it has 20 uh, alloy upkeep. That is pretty high, actually. Even at... 90 energy that 20 alloy upkeep means net you're actually only making about 10 energy assuming you could trade those alloys perfectly or buy those alloys perfectly for four energy credits a piece which is the base value if you're having to pay 5.2 energy credits per piece that actually means those 20 uh, alloys if you buy them from the market are going to be more expensive than the energy you produce thus making a Dyson Swarm on three energy technically energy inefficient. It is a net loss. If you've got lots and lots of uh, alloys lying around, I'm sure it's fine. But yeah, I think the main use for this is going to be to put it on a physics star that's making five or even six research and then boosting that up to 180 physics research. 180 physics research very early on in the game. You can probably get this going, I'm guessing, at year 50-ish. 180 physics research at year 50 is probably around what um, that's probably going to be around a third uh, maybe a quarter uh, even a fifth if you're doing really well of your overall physics output you'd have to be doing really really well for it to be a fifth because that would mean your physics output is 1000 per month so your total research would be around 3k but yeah, that I think is going to be the main use for the Dyson Swarm. Also note here, 
we can upgrade it for 10,000 alloys and 5,000 unity to turn it into a Dyson Sphere initial, which is a stage two Dyson Sphere giving us 1,000 energy credits per month. Therefore, going for a Dyson Sphere via a Dyson Swarm is probably going to be more economically efficient. If it's faster, it's definitely the way to go. If it's much slower, we might want to go and build a Dyson Sphere in the old fashioned way, however. Important to note that we may not build these Dyson Swarms around black holes, neutron stars, nor upgrade them past swarm state in systems with thriving colonies. We cannot put the Dyson Spheres in illegal places for obvious reasons, ladies and gentlemen. The second new kilo structure we are introduced to is the Arc Furnace. A splendid planet-based megastructure meant to help alleviate your industrial needs. Let's see if it can do that. Just like the Dyson Swarm, to get the most out of your shiny new Arc Furnace requires a bit more effort than merely finding a molten world and plonking it down. Instead of producing resources itself, it allows you to access more of the system's resources. In less flowery language, that means at each stage the Arc Furnace will create deposits on every planet or asteroid in the system. It doesn't say moon here, so I'm not sure if this also includes the moons. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. If it includes the moons, that's much better. First you get one mineral deposit, then another mineral deposit for a total of two minerals per planet or asteroid, then a third mineral and one alloy for three minerals, one alloy, and for the fourth and final stage, one more alloy deposit. So every planet or asteroid will have at this end point, three minerals and two alloys on every single planet and asteroid. In addition, you will also get a bit more mining efficiency from the Arc Furnace, which manifests a moderate bonus to all mining station output in the system, granting a measly plus 100%. That doubles at base level all of these deposits up to six minerals and four alloys. If you also include prosperity and some technologies, let's say you're getting another 40 or 50%, you're going to be getting that up to what? Probably seven and a half minerals and then five alloys. If you have at least five or six of these in a system, you're looking at getting a nice helpful, you know, 30 or so alloys and 50 or so minerals. The energy upkeep at this final stage though is utterly phenomenal. It is 100 energy. So assuming you've got, let's say six or seven, maybe let's go even higher, let's go with 10. Let's really push the boat out and say, you have 10 asteroids or planets in a system. That's a lot as well, that's quite a lot. You're then looking at having at least, uh, what would that be, 60 minerals and 40 alloys at least, assuming you don't have any other bonuses from technology or traditions like prosperity. 60 minerals and 40 alloys is definitely worth 100 energy, but it's not that much more efficient than trading with the market if you could trade these higher resource amounts. Also, you can only build this arc furnace on a molten world. I'm definitely underwhelmed by the arc furnace. We'll have to try it out in game to really get a good feel for it. But just reading through this and thinking about the numbers a little bit, it doesn't necessarily seem worth it for the investment, especially when you will have to pay such high energy upkeep to keep this furnace going. And that's not all. You'll also probably have to pay upkeep on all of the different mining stations around the system. So that if there is 10 mining stations actually puts this energy upkeep here at 110 energy, not just 100. I wonder if you remove the arc furnace, if those deposits go away. I'm guessing you cannot remove the arc furnace like other megastructures, but we will have to see. Now, both of these kilo structures will be available in the early mid game. I'm guessing that means tier three technology, possibly late tier two. I'm guessing tier three though. The devs hope that will be around the time you start to feel the constraints of, on your expansion as borders solidify and you begin to get cut off from the resources you desperately need. In contrast to most mega structures, you are not limited to merely one of each. However, unlike relays and gateways, they do have some limitations. You will unlock the capacity to build five of these in total, spread out through relevant technologies, with a total of six for Arc Welder Origin Empires. That's five Dyson Swarms and five Arc Furnaces. 
We've heard a lot about changes coming for synthetic and cybernetic empires. However, there are also some great bonuses coming for biological ascended empires as well in the next patch. We are of course talking about species auto modification or auto modding. Stellaris will not be automatically updating your outliner mod for when an update releases, sorry modders. Biological and cybernetic ascensions were particularly vulnerable to being very micromanagement heavy playstyles. You had a lot of power available to you if you adjusted, tweaked and applied various species templates to your pops. This was effective but very time consuming and tedious. With the 3.12 Andromeda update, the developers have introduced a new class of traits that will over time replace themselves with temporary versions of other traits based on the job the pop is currently filling. For example, a machine pop filling a farmer job will eventually have their adaptive frames changed to replicate the harvester's trait which grants additional bonuses to your farming output. And if they move to a mining job, they'll eventually switch to mimicking power drills. Automod traits have a defined list of available traits to choose from for each trait and one pop per month will adapt to their job specification modified by buildings like the robot assembly plants or gene clinics. We can see these are called adaptive frames for cybernetics and fleeting excellence for overtuned empires. So even overtuned empires can start off with the auto modded trait installed. In the mechanical list, we have propaganda machines, that is additional uh, amenities from jobs, or it could be happiness actually, no it's happiness that one. Trading algorithms for bonus uh, trade value output, logic engines for 10% research, power drills, harvesters, and superconductors for additional uh, output from the basic resources, emotion emulators for more amenities, and then on fleeting excellence, we have express tradition, which is going to grant you some unity, commercial genius, can't remember what that one does. Augmented intelligence for 10% research output. We've got the basic resource traits, then crafted smiles for 15% amenities. This is very, very powerful. This means that we can make sure that every single pop on a planet has the right trait to improve their value output for whatever job they are doing. Automod traits exist for mechanical, the adaptive frames, biological, vocational genomics, cybernetics, universal augmentations, and overtuned fleeting excellence. Vocational genomics becomes available with the targeted gene expression technology and the others are immediately available once you have access to the appropriate category of traits. So we can put this automod trait in straight away. This basically buffs any empire focusing on species traits a massive amount. It's like in essence giving an additional trait which gives between 10 and 15 percent output based on whichever job you might be in. And that is of course on top of other modifiers uh, which are going to be like, uh, I suddenly can't remember what it's called, the machine trait that's three points and grants us 5% additional resource output from jobs. You can stack that with the automod trait guaranteeing at least 15% additional resource output if not 20% depending on what job your pop ends up working. And that's on top of the regular bonuses you'll get from being a cyborg or being a synth very very powerful. The devs recognize that these traits are extremely strong but the quality of life benefits of having your pops modify themselves to fit their jobs is so darn high. As such auto modding and the associated traits are part of the free 3.12 Andromeda release. The developers are also giving modders access to these auto modding traits so you can change the list of available traits or add new traits of your own in to be added into these auto mod categories. That is crazy and very, very powerful. Next week we're going to be looking at the new endgame crisis that is coming in Stellaris. If you've enjoyed this video on the new civics coming with the Machine Age DLC, but you'd like to hear more about the new ascension paths that machines can take, some of them are very, very powerful indeed, like a nano swarm or a virtual empire. If you'd like to find out more about that, click the video on screen now.